Times Union acknowledge or know about. Um, it's a wonderful thing that Hewlett's done in that regard. We all have our favorite shows. You, you, you all remember the show on the building, which I love. I've been to Bodie a thousand times. You remember that show? I've been to Bodie a million times. I've been to my nice kids work not far from there. And I, you know, I swear I saw that show and knew things I never knew about Bodie before. Um, or Lake Mono and Mont Lake. And we start seeing things that we've seen and we just go, oh yeah, I remember that. And just things that I just really, you know, this is thing that come, comes home and gets to this heart and soul of us all. Um, the other thing about it, of course, not only does he do a lot of things that we recognize, we also all have our suggestions. Of, uh, I mean, one of the things that he's making arrangements for this program today is that people come up and once you come and once you come, because I want to tell them about something. And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a few times. And, and uh, I, of course, would do something like that, but just before I began, I began to tell them about <laughs> Anyway, I, I just I love the fact that he's here today, and I really appreciate you taking your time to, to come and take part in this program today. Um, I want to introduce this California's prospector of our gold, the gold in our backyard, a gentleman who I think you all know all about. So, Mr. Hugh Hauser, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. gave away the fact that I'm not a native Californian. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my claim to fame is that I was born 20 miles from where they make Jack Daniels whiskey. <laughs> and I see. Uh, and, and as I told the history class uh, this morning, uh, the claim to fame in Jack Daniels country is that it is actually made in a dry county. It is illegal to buy or drink the whiskey that they make in that county. And of course, no one in that county ever breaks the law. <laughs> well, I feel at home. I think I've met uh, just about everybody here today. Did I miss, did I miss a part of any table there? <laughs> that middle table? I'm sorry. Uh, but I am delighted to be here, and I tell you, I've already found out that this is the uh, 50th anniversary year of El Camino College and have already made the commitment to come back in September and do a program on the history of the And we're going to find some of the original students who were here in 1946 and 1947 and get all the old pictures together. I think the campus actually started as a Quonsatite, is that a group of Quonsatites? And, and uh, it's grown into today, I was given a quick tour of your wonderful new library facility here uh, in a time in California when libraries are downsizing and closing. Uh, you are blessed with a library here on this campus that is bigger and better than ever. And I'd like to ask the entire library staff to stand and receive our uh, praise and acknowledgement and everything else. My question is, who's one in the library? <laughs> the friends are running. They're the ones carrying those armloads of books out in the library.
And you see his name at the end of the credits as the cameraman. And now it's gotten to the place where when we arrive somewhere, we get out of the car and everybody rushes over to Louie. <laughs> Education to be had. 
and, and the, the land was bought for a dollar, and, and all of the other things that make the story of El Camino College so interesting. So we kind of uh, set out on this quest for California's gold to follow the idea that we were searching for the richness of California, the, the, the cultural and ethnic diversity, the, the topography, the natural wonders. Uh, I mean, California is a country. It's bigger than many countries. It's richer than most countries. It's as diverse as most countries. Uh, we have everything here that you could want to find anywhere in the world. And so we started out on this quest uh, in search of California's goal, and it's taken us to a lot of very interesting places. We went to the northernmost and southernmost places in California. Anybody know what the northernmost place was? Remember? Tule Lake. Right on the border, Oregon, it has the distinction of not only being the northernmost place in California, but the horseradish capital. <laughs> Tule Lake, now we're sitting, we're getting notes, I already said to me right here, my life's gone. <laughs>
We did a program once where we went in search of the exact center of California. Yeah. Remember that show? <laughs> Going up Highway 99, which is one of my favorite routes, but it's much more fun than, than uh, Interstate 5. Uh, going right through the San Joaquin Valley, a little north of Fresno, right in the median there of Highway 99 is a palm tree and a pine tree planted back to back. And that caught my eye because obviously there's some symbolism there. And sure enough, an old engineer at Caltrans years ago had planted this to symbolize going from Southern to Northern California in that spot on Highway 99 from the palm tree to the pine tree. And that got me thinking, well, wonder where the exact, I mean the exact center of California is. So we started off on this quest and went to several towns, all of which claimed to be. But when we asked them to back it up, they quickly evaporated. And we actually found, with the help of the geologic survey and satellite maps and all kinds of things, we hiked it up and found on the side of a hill, out in the country, in Madera County, the exact center. And we planted a California flag there and claimed the center. <laughs> And it's funny the way we found the exact center. If anybody see the show, you know we had the satellite technology and all this. But we also had a guy from the Geologic Survey in San Francisco in Menlo Park who came down and showed that he had cut out uh, 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 on cardboard the map of California and, and put a, balanced it on a pen. <laughs> Wagons. 
until they decided to expand even more and start making Studebaker automobiles. The Studebaker automobile came, the money and, and everything came from the money made by these two brothers in California in 1850 selling our gold miners wheelbarrows for their oil. So California is everywhere. Uh, you can't get away from it. And it's a wonderful, wonderful part of, of our history. I, I often think of, of Tennessee and how much I loved it and, and how much I still do and how much I have become a Californian and how easy it is to become a Californian. The one thing I have not been able to do since I have been here is to enjoy Menudo. <laughs> So we do a lot of stories about 
food <laughs> from time to time. We did a whole show on, on Musso Frank. Anybody ever eaten there? Yeah. Oldest restaurant in Hollywood, still going strong. Felipe's downtown across from Union Station, the double dip sandwich. I love those old places. I love all that. You can have Spago's. I'll take Felipe's any day. Do we have any questions? Usually we open up for questions, and i got a little bit more to talk about, and we'll close up. I know we've got questions. This is not a quiet group yet. <laughs> Approximately how many people are on your research staff that help put these programs? Well, we have a very small staff, just a couple of people, and, and, and that's for two reasons. Uh, number one, I don't like to know too much about what I'm doing. <laughs>
so that I'm constantly bombarded with new facts, new information, new people. I mean, I do have what I think is one of the greatest jobs in the world because I'm paid, albeit a small salary, <laughs> to travel around California and spend my time with nice people, hearing their stories about their lives and having them show me their communities. Uh, a lot of people say, well, how do you get people to be so warm and open and, and give you so much information on the air? Well, the greatest compliment you can give someone is to be interested in who they are. So if someone has spent their life growing uh, daffodils, and you visit their daffodil garden to talk with them about daffodils, you're not going to have any trouble getting daffodil information from them. <laughs> because it's what they love. It's their passion in life. And so seldom in life do we spend any time caring about what other people do. And one of the things that we try to get across in our program, not necessarily in a conscious way, but certainly in a, in a subconscious way, is that if you tune in our program one day and you see a program about Menudo, or about growing daffodils. Now, you may not give a wit about Menudo or daffodils, but the people in that show do. And if you give them the respect of listening just for 30 minutes about who they are and what they're all about, then maybe next week when you're on talking about what your passion is, they'll give you the same respect. And they'll listen and learn from you the same way you listened and learned from them. It's a very basic theory and philosophy. It works. We're not asking you to become a Menudo expert. We're not asking you to have to go out and write a thesis on Menudo. We're asking you for 26 minutes of your time to sit down and learn a little bit about something you don't know anything about. That, that may be all you ever know about Menudo, but it's more than you knew before. And if you, you now understand the role that Menudo plays in a lot of people's lives. I'll get off this Menudo. <laughs> We're beginning to feel uncomfortable. Yes. Um, I've seen you on the chapel through uh, First Interstate Building. Now you're welcome to A lot of people had to cut that program off. Oh, really? Yeah, they're very afraid of heights. <laughs> well, it's funny. How many people saw the show we did on top of the first interstate show? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a touchy subject for me since Wells Fargo underwrites the show. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> we were on top of the first interstate building, and uh, and you know we went off the edge with the window washer who was a great guy, but had been for him, we never would have lasted, so he was this great guy who was talking to us all the time, and made us feel very comfortable, and, and kept us from remembering where we were. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you're on top, and that's the tallest building west of the Mississippi River, that building. And we were standing out on the edge of that building, and the building is built in stages that go in so that they have this permanent crane up there on a track that goes around. And to get down to the middle part of the building, the crane has to go way out because it has to get beyond the next level down the building. So we were getting ready to step onto this scaffold being held by two wires, 78 floors up. And I turned to Louie and I said, you know, Louie, if we quit right now, no one will ever know what they're doing. See, I do have control over editing. You would never have known that we backed out. You know, and we went ahead and did it. Of course, poor Louie, you know, I, sometimes I forget that he's got that camera. And he's seeing through this one. He's not able to see. So he goes on faith. There's going to be something under his foot. That's one of the reasons I talk with her so much, really, is say, why should 
Del Dewey or watching this branch or watching that rattlesnake down there. <laughs> Saw a snake. It, 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 I mean, I don't know what it would do to him. We've never, he's never seen, we've never run across a snake, believe it or not. If we ever saw a snake, we would be gone. <laughs> we do a lot of those things. We went down in the mine, the gold mine, the 16 to 1 mine. I get a little claustrophobic when you're in a space this big, you know, a thousand feet down. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, it's all part of our job, it's all part of this adventure. Uh, our show in uh, July, which we just shot a month ago, I went up to the Blue Angels down in North Central, which was really something. They, the Blue Angels have been training in El Centro in Imperial County for 40 years now. So we went down to do a show on the, on the California connection with Blue Angels, and they took me up in this plane to take off. And we're going down the runway, taking off, and the pilot says to me in the back seat, Are you ready? And I, I said, Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> They have a camera on the back of his seat facing back toward me. And we're in this canopy, you know, the plastic, clear plastic canopy, so you can see out. And, and you can see when he said, are you ready? You see my eyes. <laughs> and I said, yes. And with that, he goes straight up. And the, the, the camera in the plane is shooting. Have you ever seen these cameras in rockets? and they take off, you see the earth falling away, you know. That's what it was. It was my face and California falling away. <laughs> in the background. And we proceeded then to fly upside down for 15 minutes at 700 miles an hour. There's going to be a few, a few bleeps edited out. <laughs>
for me to lose that accent would be to turn my back on who I was and who my parents were and what my background was. And that I always felt in my heart that California accepted people with funny accents. <laughs> and now that accent has become one of my trademarks. The thing that they wanted me to lose, to give up that first day on the air, has become something that has, is part of, of what we're all about in this room today. That's food for thought for all of us, especially for young people. And I think that combining that sense of pride with my parents and my background, and also the fact that when you travel around California today and you see all the energy and all the excitement, and all the hope, and all the passion, that you think back to what we see on local news every night. And I'll give you an example. If you were locked in a room, and the only view you had of Los Angeles was what you saw on the 6 o'clock news, you wouldn't want to be let out of that locked room. You'd be afraid, You'd be afraid to come out on the street. But let me tell you something. I can give a personal testimony. This state is filled with goodness and good people and optimism and excitement. And for those people who tell me that California has seen her best days, I tell them from personal experience and from a strong passion that I believe with all my heart that the best days of California are not behind me. They're yet to come. Thank you very much.